He is the founder of the Serval Project, an open source project which allows mobile telephones to work without remote carriers uh, for disaster, remote or developing world situations where networks are unavailable, overwhelmed or unaffordable, and usually all three. Like many in the open source community, Paul suffers from a critically high idea flux to available time ratio. <laughs> His discussion today is entitled Making Mobile Communication Secure and describing them as surprisingly insecure, which is sad considering that good cryptographic frameworks exist. Could everyone please give Paul a very warm welcome. Welcome all along this morning. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Excellent. I wasn't hearing too much come back. Um, how are we all doing this morning? You all moderately slept? <laughs> well slept? To the straw poll. So who, who's well slept? Oh, actually not too bad. Moderately slept? Um, medium rare slept. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's right. And, and those in the, the blue sleep kind of uh, category. Um, not too bad this morning. So um, today I actually want to cover uh, a whole bunch of things. So actually, a quick straw poll that will be helpful for me. How many of you here have never heard of the Serval Project before in any significant way? Okay, good. Pro something like about half of you. So I, I think I've done the right thing by trying to have a bit of uh, general information here uh, as well. Um, can anyone recognise what this is? Yes? Because <laughs> <laughs> right, the, the Mark I. Smartphone, Sonic Screwdog. Yes. Um, <laughs> So, so this is probably about a, a $9 um, telephone handset that someone has dutifully uh, removed the standard RJ11 connector, which is a, such a, a droll connector because it only fits into one thing. Um, <laughs> with this much more versatile approach. Um, and without going into any further detail and, and risk being uh, guilty of uh, promoting crime, um, that's about all the hardware you need to tap an ordinary uh, landline phone. They're actually, they're not secure. And of course, it's totally analog, isn't it? So once you, you snip on there, um, you know, it comes with buttons because the buttons are there so that you can dial using someone else's phone number um, and call Sweden or wherever you want to call. Um, so landline phones aren't particularly secure. Um, nor, as it turns out, are our digital mobile phone networks. Um, if anyone is, uh, is old enough like myself to remember the transition from um, the terrible old days of analog mobile phones, um, mine on a full charge could do almost eight hours. Um, and you know, this whole move to digital because it's secure and better and shinier and, and yeah, in a pile of ways it is. Unfortunately, the, uh, the crypto that they put on them uh, was not that great to begin with and you know, now people can sort of routinely exploit it. So we have this problem that mobile telecommunications uh, is quite uh, vulnerable uh, to, uh, to intercept in a variety of ways. And so in the several project where we want to make infrastructure independent telecommunications, we wanted to try and avoid uh, some of these problems. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through. Um, but the Serval project itself, uh, we have a very simple mission. We want communications for those in need. Um, and like many good uh, you know, uh, treaty texts and the like, we haven't actually defined precisely what we mean by communications um, or need. Um, <laughs> and really, we've done it on purpose because we, we, those. Sorry, yes, uh, those. Yeah, look, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's English, right? There's really not a great deal of precision in any of those words. Uh, the, the quotes, however, are uh, I think reasonably accurate and descriptive. Um, <laughs> But so we, we really look at need as a, a whole variety of things. And it was disaster relief uh, that really uh, that, uh, you know, set us on this kind of mission. And sort of the Haiti earthquake was really a, uh, you know, a key moment in that of just seeing and realising the need that, uh, that would result. Um, but we actually have, again, just as we haven't really defined need, um, we haven't specifically desi defined disaster. Um, I work in a university, uh, I'm part of a disaster research institute, and actually getting a definition of disaster out of people is, uh, is surprisingly difficult, particularly actually inside a disaster research uh, centre where you know, it, it has implications as to what it means. Um, a common meaning of disaster is actually an event which overwhelms a local community's ability to respond. Uh, so, you know, if you trip over and stub your toe and need to call an ambulance uh, and an ambulance is available to come and, uh, and uh, deal with your toe, uh, that's not a disaster, that's an emergency because the ambulance can come and help. 
If, however, everyone here at this conference stubbed their toes and all needed ambulance assistance with their stubbed toes, um, we rapidly find that there were probably maybe a, a dozen ambulance uh, would be able to turn up uh, fairly swiftly, and everyone else would be left uh, in the misery of their stubbed toes without uh, proper medical support. Uh, that would technically be a disaster. And so disasters can be uh, you know, triggered by natural events. Uh, so if a volcano were to erupt uh, under this building, uh, that would be a, a natural disaster. Um, if it erupted under certain other modern architectural buildings, uh, it's probably a little more questionable as to whether it would actually be a disaster. <laughs> Uh, but the point nonetheless applies. But we think about uh, disasters, whether they are uh, naturally um, caused, whether they are politically caused. Uh, you, know, we, you don't need a geothermal volcano uh, to disrupt society. Uh, human beings have amassed a surprising number of ways to actually disrupt human society and safety uh, without having to resort to uh, uh, using geothermal effects. So we, we have this quite view, uh, quite large view uh, of that. And communications we see as being a, a, a basic uh, human right. And so anything which impinges on the ability of people to communicate, and we would actually argue communicate privately, uh, private correspondence, uh, is actually impinging their uh, human rights, uh, in particularly in, in freedom of expression. And the UN has actually kind of backed this up a bit uh, in recent years, which is uh, lovely, despite the fact that other pieces of the UN are trying to prevent private communications. Um, it's, it's wonderful uh, cognitive dissonances that occur in these large organisations and, uh, and governments. So anyway, what we've set out to do is to say, okay, imagine you're in a disaster, all infrastructure has gone. Uh, perhaps the disaster is that uh, someone actually has managed to make a transporter uh, and they've actually managed to transport all of us down to, uh, to Antarctica um, and we have no recourse to any infrastructure whatsoever. We want something that can actually still work there to let us uh, to communicate, uh, to send meaningless Twitter messages and do all of the other things that have become an intrinsic part of modern society. But uh, we're not ignorant of infrastructure. We want to make use of it whenever we can. Uh, there's no point you know, sharing a, uh, you know, a, a cute kitten photo uh, on a mesh network if you can't then actually annoy the rest of the work global population uh, with that same photo. Um, or, uh, perhaps a little more importantly, being able to get uh, calls in and out and share situation awareness in a disaster out and get information in, weather forecasts, you know, whatever the, uh, uh, the matter is. Uh, so some acknowledgements. Uh, we have been very fortunate in the Civil Project to have uh, support from a number of organisations, uh, totalling, uh, it's now actually uh, a little over a million dollars of uh, financial support that we've had and we are exceptionally grateful to these various organisations. Uh, the Awesome Foundation were the first people to back us. Um, if you have a fantastic idea and you need a thousand dollars in a hurry to, uh, to make it uh, and it's something awesome, um, go to their website. Um, the application process is a web form that basically says our attention span is short, keep your text short, uh, and every 30 days each chapter gives out $1,000 to the most awesome idea uh, that comes in. Uh, and of course it's 10 ordinary people who put in 100 bucks a month who judge what is awesome. So it's, um, it's really lovely. Uh, Flinders University, who is my employer and has been for a, a, a number of years, uh, they support, they actually they, they pay me to do all this stuff now, which is uh, really fantastic, and uh, their support is, uh, is tremendous. Uh, the Enelnet Foundation have supported us with a number of grants uh, as well. The Shuttleworth Foundation have provided uh, very substantial financial support uh, and, uh, and other forms of support as well. And more recently, the New America Foundation uh, and Open uh, Internet Technology Project, both of which are very concerned about people being able to communicate freely. Uh, and there's a, a number of other donors and volunteers and uh, our teams. We've got a couple of our developers, uh, Andrew and Jeremy down here, uh, Romana back in Adelaide, um, Corey, um, Lynn, a whole bunch of people who, uh, without their efforts, we wouldn't be where we're at uh, today. So part of what I'm going to talk about, and the headline for the talk is about uh, securing mobile communications, and in particular looking at our security framework that we've put in. Uh, so you can actually, and uh, you're, you're quite welcome in fact, to, uh, to you know, uh, hop across to, uh, to GitHub, you don't need a Git account, you can just download the ODT uh, uh, from the relevant place there. This is actually a really, really important point. Um, the more eyeballs we can get on our security framework to look for um, faults and deal with them, the better. Because one day, lives probably will depend on uh, the privacy and security of communication over what we're creating. Um, and indeed, one of my key intentions with this talk is actually to, to try and get that socialised out and start getting to people to, uh, um, to look at that. 
because uh, security is it's like booting a castle. It doesn't matter how many turrets and uh, you know and uh, and boiling oil pots you have. Um, if someone has the key to the secret passage, then well, what's the point really? So, what can the servo mesh software do at present? So, uh, we have encrypted voice calls. Uh, we have encrypted um, SMS type service, which we call MeshMS, and we have a file and data distribution system that we call Rhizome. And that's, they're really the kind of the, uh, the core uh, aspects of the, uh, the Servile Mesh software. We then have a, a nice crowdsourced uh, mapping application that uses OpenStreetMap data, and we are very much looking forward to the next talk that's in this room, uh, talking about OpenStreetMap uh, use in humanitarian situations. Uh, because we've been using OpenStreetMap data, uh, so using our reliable and infrastructure independent transport, and then using uh, the OpenStreetMap information to, uh, uh, to support uh, these sorts of applications. And of course, you know, these sort of meta capabilities of having publicly exposed APIs, the whole thing is open source, obviously, uh, and our security framework that we think is actually, uh, you know, until one of you points out a fatal flaw in it, uh, we think is actually a really nice uh, approach to that. And uh, we have fully planned distributed social networking uh, applications. And actually, a bit of a plug on that, we've got something like one to two dozen of really nicely, clearly defined sub-projects to make the Serval Mesh even more wonderful and amazing. Um, and we would love for volunteers to help us realise uh, some of those things, like for instance making a, um, a mesh Twitter type service and then actually tying it into real Twitter, um, you know, are, are things that would be really exciting uh, to see. And if any of you would like to get a higher degree or just would like the, the government to pay you a higher degree scholarship while you work on amazing open source stuff and as a side effect get a higher degree, um, being based in the university, we can totally explore that uh, uh, that opportunity. And some of the, you know, the, you may think that you're not able to get enrolled in a higher degree. Um, talk to us anyway. Um, I, I don't have an honours degree, um, but I went straight from bachelor to doing a PhD. Um, there, there are ways. Um, and we, you know, we can uh, look at recognising actual practical experience as well as academic experience to, uh, to try and uh, you know, make these things happen uh, if people are interested. And you wouldn't have to move to Adelaide either. Uh, unlike Google, we understand the concept of telecommuting. <laughs> so so it, we've talked a little about uh, our general approach that you know, we want to make something that is not just a, a tweak uh, on what's already out there, but actually, you know, it needs to be radical and it needs to work without infrastructure. So when we kind of looked around and we sort of saw, you know, there's a, a few things out there that kind of, like, you know, go some way to doing what we're doing. Um, and, you know, particularly in the humanitarian space, there's lots of things that, you know, they say, oh, look, we, we, they can work over a 2G network. They can work over only SMS backhaul uh, to work. But what happens when that goes down? Like the Victorian bushfires, the towers were up, but the backhaul was actually gone. And there was no communication available. And this is something that's repeated again and again and again uh, when disasters strike. Uh, or in politically induced disasters where you know, the government just goes and you know, presses the shiny big red button that turns the entire network off. Uh, you know, we need to work with zero infrastructure. And so we started thinking about you know, what that entails. And it, and it became clear to us that the existing protocols really were not well suited to um, you know, these mesh networks and that therefore there was this justification for us to, uh, to take a revolutionary path. And I, and I think what we've managed to achieve actually has been a, a vindication that uh, we weren't uh, completely, well, as I was say, not completely insane, we probably are completely insane, uh, but that we were actually uh, justified in those decisions. So um, where we're at at the moment, that, that core stack of, uh, of voice, um, uh, mesh MS and file and data distribution um, pretty much work. There's a whole pile of refinement we need to do on it, you know, like multi-hop voice, we need to do some improvements to routing. Um, you know, this is one of many projects of, you know, taking, say, for instance, you know, the Batman or OLSRD routing um, algorithms or the nice bits out of the ball and putting them into our, uh, our overlay mesh, and I'll talk about the overlay in a moment. Um, the 0 0.90 release of the Serval Mesh um, is probably hitting Google Play as we're talking. Um, it may take 12 to 24 hours to go through. Oh, Jeremy's just pressed the button, there you go. Uh, the, the release has happened here. The, the future is being made today. Um, 
However, you're here at LCA, you don't have to settle for 0.90. We have a pre-release of 0.91 progress uh, that's available that you can, uh, if you wish to, uh, try on your phones uh, and, uh, and make mesh calls and things. So uh, unlike most classroom situations, uh, here you're actually actively encouraged to play with your mobile phones while I'm talking. Um, so if I, if I hear happy mesh ringing noises in the background or if people manage to figure out how to, to send messages or ring the phones that are in my pockets, go for it. Um, and we're, we're actively pursuing what we're calling our 1.00 release. That wasn't a mesh phone, by the way. <laughs> it's just my wristwatch. Um, uh, so we're pushing on towards a uh, release 1.00 where we want you know, all of the functionality that we've already talked about uh, and get away from the need for root and ad hoc on a phone and sort of have a, a nice sort of seamless experience on a, a phone that lacks that. There are problems with doing that, uh, some of which we'll touch on uh, and others of which uh, you're quite welcome to, uh, to talk to me about uh, after. And again, there's lots of fun development in Java and C and documentation and UI and all sorts for anyone that's interested. So. We don't use VoIP on the mesh um, because we worked out really early on uh, when we went up to, uh, to ArcRuler on the Outback and we were sort of doing our initial uh, deployments in uh, uh, trials rather in 2010 uh, that packet loss and SIP and RTP um, really don't get along very well. Um, we're sort of you know we're ringing from one phone to another and it's like it's not ringing. What is going on? And then at one point I actually didn't hang up the phone that was doing the ringing and then like a minute and a half later the other phone actually suddenly started ringing. Uh, and then it dawned on me that packet loss and retries were uh, not particularly optimal. Um, and also if you want to have encryption and security on SIP and RTP um, it's kind of based around this whole central security uh, certificate model and you go well where's your CA when you're in the middle of nowhere and maybe it's just two people with two phones uh, communicating. And um, also if we actually do VoIP, that means we need IP, and that means we need to have uh, IP allocation on these networks. And that actually gets quite problematic if you want uh, full mobility. Uh, so who here knows about the birthday paradox? Yep, a reasonable number. Who's never heard of the birthday paradox? Um, so how, how many people do we think we have here in the room? 70. 70, excellent, the man's already been counting. So there is something like a 99.998% chance that there are two people in this room who have the same day and month of their birthday. In fact, with 70 people here in the room, there's actually a good chance that two people actually share exactly the same complete birthday. Um, translating that over to the mesh, um, if you have a, uh, a slash, you know, like if you have a, you know, eight bits of, uh, of network address space available to you, so a slash 24, after about 16 devices randomly picking their network addresses, chances are two of them will pick the same address. It's really, really annoying. Because um, even if you have you know, like 10 slash 8, you can have, I don't know, about 4,000 devices uh, before they're going to start having clashes. Um, in fact, even if we had all of IPv4, we actually kind of still have a bit of a problem. Um, and so we wanted to get away from that. And also, you know, just uh, avoid a whole part of the, the auto configuration uh, issues on there. And also we wanted to get away from the, the loose coupling between IP address and entity of this whole, you know, like IPsec is this huge, big, complicated monster that um, causes endless hurt and pain to those who try and set it up. We wanted to completely avoid that and just have the, uh, the trust relationship uh, built in. Um, and IPv6 um, isn't actually a, a good solution either. Uh, so, you know, if we say there's, what, you know, four to eight billion people in the world at the moment, so two to the 33 people, um, Internet of Things means that there's probably going to be more like, you know, we should be designing for, say, two to the 48 devices. Um, and that suddenly means that we actually need, you know, potentially two to the 96 addresses. Uh, but IPv6 actually only has um, 64 bits of host address. Um, and so you actually you still have this kind of issue and you end up with you know, packet headers the size of a small planet. Um, and it still doesn't solve this security um, coupling issue. You still need to have an IPsec or something and that means you need central certificate authority. And it's just um, not that ideal. Basically, we could make better use of the, the same number of bytes. Um, some other interesting things, you kind of go, well, you know, if we're moving away from IP, that's going to cause a whole pile of legacy application support problems on the mesh. You're absolutely correct. That's a design feature. Um, because it means it's much harder for people to actually fill the mesh network with lolcats and everything else. Um, and, you know, uh, Windows machines, you know, announcing um, NetBIOS uh, and goodness knows what else. Uh, we're, actually, we're making it an opt-in to make use of the mesh. And we think that that's actually a really good idea. Um, and also, if we ad hoc Wi-Fi, really, really annoying interoperability problems. 
Uh, so, you know, if, if you have a Samsung device and an IDOS device, you have to turn the IDOS device on first before the Samsung if you actually want them to mesh. Um, and then some devices' broadcast packets will go over ad hoc, but unicast won't get properly delivered, like in uh, that situation. And there's, it, it, there's a, the, 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 yeah, it was never properly standardised. Well, uh, properly standardised, they just didn't implement the standard. Uh, well, actually, the, the standard doesn't. It doesn't fully describe uh, sufficiently, and of course, the standard is, is suboptimal. Their idea of the IEEE's idea of a, an ad hoc Wi-Fi mesh was definitely no more than there are people in this room. Um, ideally, actually, three or four people just trying to share a lolcat photo, or um, um, I don't know, share an ad from one of their favoured vendors or something. Um, I mean, they're doing. I mean, Wi-Fi is absolutely fantastic. Don't get me wrong, but it's just you know, no one saw a commercial value in ad hoc, and so it's kind of you know, it's moved back in the, the standards process and doesn't really have anyone driving it. Um, but as I've hinted at already, if we can actually uh, replace IP addresses with something which actually gets us baked in security from the base, then that's a much, much nicer thing. And so what we have done, in fact, is we're using 256-bit elliptic curve uh, public keys using the, uh, the NACL uh, crypto library, crypto box keys primarily. Um, so your network address is a public key, and we tunnel this uh, in IPv uh, in, uh, over IP or anything else. Um, so we, we don't have any IP address challenges. In the worst case situation, we can in principle have a global scale mesh where everyone had exactly the same IPv4 address, and our mesh would actually still work. It would just do broadcast packets, everyone would receive them because they're on the same subnet, uh, and life would be fairly happy and wonderful. Uh, not counting the fact that broadcast over Wi-Fi actually has a whole pile of fun problems of its own. Um, and 256 bits gives us more than enough scope to deal with this whole birthday paradox problem. It means that we can have something like 2 to the 128 devices on the network. So we can have more devices on the network than IPv6 supports um, and still be safe from the birthday paradox. Um, and of course, I mean, IPv6 couldn't do this because IPv6 kind of needs to geographically aggregate routes on a mesh. We're freed from that kind of, well, actually, we, we just can't achieve it. Uh, and so uh, we might as well have the benefits that come from breaking that symmetry. Um, and of course, because your network address is your public key, you can't spoof. Um, you know, your device's ID is its public key. You, you can prove that you own uh, the address. And so that, it creates a, a fantastic foundation for everything that we want to do uh, on top of that. Um, <laughs> as it says, gross simplifications uh, coming up, but I just want to give you some idea of the, uh, uh, of the, the crypto and how the crypto works. Because I'm saying about this whole thing of the public keys and it means that you can do this stuff. So how many people here are familiar with Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange? Okay, how many of you understand how it works? <laughs> yeah, no, not too bad. So, um, we'll, we'll cover a little bit more of that. So, um, the crypto that we're using, the 256-bit elliptic curve crypto, has a wonderful property that mathematicians aren't interested in the discrete logarithm problem that underlies it. Um, mathematicians are much, much more interested in factoring really, really big numbers. Um, admittedly not prime numbers because they're actually really boring to factor because well, this is one in itself, right? Um, but numbers that are made of two prime numbers are much more interesting to try and factor, um, assuming that the two prime numbers are both really big ones. Um, so what's happened over time is like, we've had to go from like RSA 512 to 1024 to 2048 and all the rest to get equivalent security. And it's actually Moore's law has accounted for a bit of that. But not a whole lot. Um, the rest of it is these, these jolly mathematicians who love factoring big numbers. Um, and so they have made advances. Um, I can't remember the, the, the particular, like the, you know, um, how many bits of security they've worn off purely from their, their furtive minds being very clever about solving very tricky problems. Uh, but as I say, fortunately, very few of them are interested in solving discrete logarithm problems. So at the moment, 256-bit ECC is as good as um, 3K-bit RSA. I wouldn't mind betting that in five years' time it will be as good as 4,000-bit RSA. Um, not because somehow we'll have got stronger, but because RSA will continue to get eroded because it's based on prime number uh, uh, multiplication and properties. Um, NACL is actually really nice as well. It holds a whole pile of speed records. And when you're talking about $71 phones that you buy from the post office, ooh, did someone just send me something? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We'll have to, uh, uh, to have a, a look and see in a moment. Um, you might have got to one of those phones instead of this phone so far. But $71 phones that have 600 megahertz processors, the speed of crypto is really important. We can encrypt a phone call, so both ways encryption, using about 2% of the CPU on a 600 megahertz phone. This is, we think this is really, really cool. Um, 
And actually, it kind of says that all modern phones should actually have like the phone network should support better crypto than they do. Because the old argument of, well, look, you know, your average, you know, old Nokia uh, dumb phone uh, could support ROT 13 or ROT 14 if you're really lucky, um, <laughs> is now kind of, I, I think, uh, out the window. Um, and also NACL, so who here remembers that the, the Sony PlayStation 3 um, terrible crypto break? Yes. They did a really naughty thing with reusing nonces. Um, the people that wrote NACL, so Dan Bernstein, who's quite a, a famous crypto guy, um, who's written this, has gone, yeah, like that's a really, really dumb way to break your crypto. Um, so NACL actually uses a hash of the data you're encrypting as the nonce and does all this lovely stuff so that you don't have to feed in a magic random number um, to actually get uh, secure encryption that doesn't reveal your private key to everyone. Um, so how does it work? Ooh. Now that was someone sending a message through. What does it say? Is it repeatable? That's the first thing. <laughs> Hooray's for salt. Excellent. Marvellous. Um, so, this is very vaguely, but entirely unlike how uh, elliptic curve crypto uh, Diffie Hellman key exchange works. Oh, someone else has sent another one. Hello, everybody. Excellent. <laughs> well done. This is this is pleasing to see because uh, it says to me that you know the software we're putting out there actually works, um, and that people can actually use it without me having to guide them to the install. Okay. So imagine you have a number. So we kind of keep this down to sort of like year nine uh, algebra. Um, and I understand that that may still uh, be uh, grievous to some, and that's fine. There's a whole pile of things that I'm not good at either, so worry not. So, uh, if, we have, if my private key is A, my public key is A multiplied by the number 9. Uh, the most accurate point in this statement actually is multiplied by 9. Um, in fact, that actually is how the, uh, the crypto uh, uh, box uh, crypto works. What is not particularly accurate is A multiplied by. Um, so here, multiply is this very special value of multiply for which there is no equivalent divide by. Um, and it's quite bizarre. So that means that you can't divide my public key 9 times A by 9 to work out my private key. Um, or if you can, then actually you've totally broken elliptic curve crypto and congratulations, so you've got a fantastic paper and really annoy a lot of people. <laughs> So shared secret agreement, so if you have a key, a private key B, your public key is 9B, I know that you've got 9B, I know I've got A, I can multiply them together uh, to get 9BA, which is the same as 9AB, we can each work out that secret, but everyone else can only work out 9A, 9B, um, which may or may not be equal to 81AB, um, but what's certainly clear is you can't divide out that extra 9, and so no one else can figure out uh, what's going on. So this gives us end-to-end -end encryption in every packet. Uh, and I can't remember whether I've written it on the next slide or not. Uh, no, I haven't. We'll get to this one in a second. But this means that on a several overlay mesh, unless you specify otherwise, every packet is authenticated and encrypted using this shared secret agreement. Because you don't actually need to exchange any packets to do it. Because you're supplying, like, you know, you say, I want to send a packet to network address blah, um, and the several mesh goes, excellent, you've just told me their public key. I know my private key. Encrypted packet. Very, very simple. Um, and so uh, we need to keep your private key private. And so we have this lovely uh, keyring structure that can have one or more identities uh, in it. Uh, so you can, if you're a sensitive user, you could have a public identity that you really don't care about anyone seeing. And you can have a private identity that you don't want you know, the militia that are about to pull you over to see all the people that you've been talking to in your message traffic. Uh, so you might. Uh, this isn't in the software at the moment, but it will be in time. Um, and someone can implement it if they would like to. Um, that you can uh, lock that identity and unlock another identity um, that is completely different. And we're even going to add support for it, um, blowing up forever the secret identity when you unlock another uh, public identity so that you can have uh, plausible deniability. Okay, we are going to go very speedy fast uh, through the bulk of the rest of this. Uh, so on Android, we have the server overlay mesh with our mesh datagram protocol. Um, which is uh, what has this lovely encryption stuff in it. On top of that, we have our voice over mesh protocol, so it's encrypted by virtue of being in that. Uh, so you can make phone calls, you can have uh, the peer list, and I'm not actually going to be able to go through all of this uh, because I've talked very wonderfully for a, a while, but we're going to run out of time otherwise. Uh, we can also tie this into OpenBTS. So we're working with the, uh, the Commotion uh, project. Uh, to secure communications between OpenBTS, uh, open source GSM base stations. Uh, this still actually means your communications are wide open over the, uh, the GSM segment, but we can at least protect the traffic uh, in between them. 
uh, we have a lovely test framework where we actually test the core servo decomponent, which is actually what does all of the crypto uh, and everything. Uh, so Rhizome is our store and forward system that complements MDP. So MDP is a bit like UDP. This is actually, you say, here's a whole file. Uh, I want it encrypted or not encrypted. Um, and we do uh, signing of the, uh, of the bundle to make sure that no one can mess with it uh, except for you. Uh, and we have a mechanism where you can grow that. So in fact, this mesh MS works by growing uh, a bundle. Uh, but we can also store the private key for the bundle, which is a, a completely separate rolled key, uh, in there in a way that only you, if you own your private key, can extract it. So we don't have to keep even a record of the bundles you've published. This is also really good for plausible deniability. Uh, because no one can look at it and go, ah, well, we can't get your private key, but we know that you made you know, that bundle that has that cat, which has offended, uh, you know, I don't know, dictator X or something. Um, uh, so th this is not the current packet format for, uh, uh, for VOMP, uh, I apologise. But the key point is, because we have all of this lovely uh, crypto baked in from the ground up, we can actually set up an encrypted voice call using two 60-byte packets. Um, and it's very tolerant to packet loss, unlike SIP and RTP, which probably takes something like 10 kilobytes of data to set up an unencrypted voice call. Um, and one of the key things on a mesh network is you need to do preemptive retransmission if you want data to actually uh, arrive in any reliable manner. Uh, so unlike SIP where it sends out one, hey, can you like make your end ring every 30 seconds or so? Uh, we send them out every 125 milliseconds until the other end acknowledges one uh, because it's the kind of thing you need to do on a mesh. Okay, uh, we've already kind of talked about uh, that one. Uh, one of the secret wrinkles that if you read that security framework document you'll discover is that there are two key spaces in NACL. Unfortunately, neither of them can do all of the things we want. One can do public signing, the other one can do everything except public signing. Um, so we have a mechanism where we actually can, uh, using what we call a, a Hansen packet, um, which is a, a please explain request, uh, for translating from one key space to the other. Uh, Hansen packets actually appear in other places in the civil mesh as well. So we abbreviate those long addresses into short addresses and we pass around the abbreviations. Uh, but if someone needs an explanation, they send a Hansen packet and that gets the, uh, the full address. Um, and it actually means that we have a more efficient uh, use of space than IPv6, even though we have longer addresses than IPv6. Um, so MDP, uh, we've talked about uh, already. Here is an MDP ping, um, just to show you. Look, my ping replies are coming back signed or signed and encrypted depending on where they've come from. Um, it's baked into the bottom layer. Um, and look, it says, warning, your ping packet will not be encrypted. It will still be signed, but it will actually be encrypted. And of course, uh, it would be helpful if I could, could spell in that particular release of the software. <laughs> So ha you, you can have much faith in the, uh, the quality of our software and the, uh, the security framework. So in other words, look through it really carefully because um, maybe we've left a T out somewhere else. Um, okay, so the MDP packet structure. Um, essentially we have some header stuff. The, uh, the recipient and sender fields, they're all variable length because as was talked about, we can abbreviate addresses uh, and expand those as we, uh, we have need. Um, we also, the source port and destination port, we allow up to 32 bits. But, you know, if, if, if it's a low port number, why do we need four bytes? We can abbreviate that again um, using a, you know, an appropriate length coding field. Uh, and so then we use the, uh, we need a, a nonce for the crypto box. Um, this is different to the nonce for the signing, which is what undid the PS3. Um, it, reuse of a nonce here only means that if you had two encrypted payloads, people could work out the XOR between the two. Um, it doesn't reveal your private key, uh, which is helpful. Ooh, someone else has sent something. Uh, and so then we use a crypto box to encapsulate. You can't even tell what the source and destination ports are uh, until you decrypt it. Uh, and then we put one or more of these together into an overall frame. Uh, so this is for transport over IP. Um, we're going to, and if I actually have enough time, uh, we'll talk about making a mesh helper device that may have RF front ends that are completely different and we won't do it over IP at all. Also makes our life a whole lot easier. We don't have to write kernel drivers then. It's just, you know, oh, you've given me a UART that talks to a radio. Excellent. I will send packets out uh, in the several overlay mesh format and do whatever I need uh, with them. Um, or you could write them out on a piece of paper and carry them to someone else and they could type them in, you know, or have trained squirrels, whatever your preferred mode of uh, network transport is. Uh, so VOMP, we have 
talked about substantially already. Um, just again, a comparison of the complexity of SIP versus VOMP. Here's our entire core state, um, uh, finite state machine. Look, it fits on a single slide, um, which is a uh, substantial advance on, uh, on SIP. Uh, and so here's just an example of sequence through. I'm, I'm just going to skip over this for now due to time. Uh, so authentication of man in the middle attacks. This is a really important piece. If I know your network address, there's no problem for man in the middle. If I don't know your network address, um, in a disaster situation, we still want to err on the side of letting people communicate. So when you dial a number, it will give you all of the people who are claiming to have that phone number, uh, which we look up via basically a phone number ARP uh, kind of process called several DNA. Um, and so we have plans to implement uh, some nice mechanisms for, you know, we might show a pretty picture of the same on both phones based on shared secret calculation. It's a whole pile of fun ways to do that. Again, if someone would like to do it, really fun project to work on. But once you have their, um, their serval ID, their public key cached, then man in the middle attacks are not a problem at all. Uh, Rhizome, we've uh, talked a little bit uh, about that already. And of course, it means you can transport data uh, via whatever means uh, you like. Um, so. But it, I mean, you may laugh at the pigeon and the bicycle. Um, if the pigeon was riding the bicycle, now that would be humorous. <laughs> However, a pigeon has two legs, each of which can carry a micro SD card. Micro SD cards are affordable at 64 gigabytes. Your carrier pigeon can do 100 kilometers an hour over 300 kilometer range. On D-Day in World War II, 32 pigeons made it back from the front lines into the UK within six hours over 400 kilometers. Uh, admittedly, one of them ended up in a chimney and was only discovered last year. <laughs> The rest of them made their way through. Um, and you can carry a tremendous amount of store and forward traffic uh, via carrier pigeon. There's also an RFC on pigeon Yes, there is. It would need substantial updating um, to support this. But again, if someone would like to update the RFC, um, yeah, we've got a fair bit of time between now and April. Um, we could probably squeeze it in. Um, indeed, there's a whole pile of fun stuff. So actually, we did a really big jumbo packet. We actually carried MeshMS um, traffic via Boeing 747 from Africa back to Australia to deliver a message into our lab uh, using no communications infrastructure, just a Boeing 747. Um, <laughs> but they often can be easier to source in a disaster than a, a working phone tower. Uh, but likewise, I mean, people carrying phones around on, uh, uh, on bicycles or by foot is going to transport the data around. Uh, Ryzen we've talked about already a bit. Uh, file distribution, yes, we can update the several mesh application over the mesh. In fact, we've done that twice this week already, I think. Yes, yes. Um, and you'll probably see more updates come out if you, uh, if you download the, the one off the QR code at the end of this talk, um, it will get updated by other people's phones around the place here. This is really cool. It means you can have a disaster zone, drop one phone in with a several mesh, and it can, uh, people can copy the software off of that, and then you can put in a single update, and it will propagate through. Um, we have plans to, uh, LimeWire got undone by self-updates. Uh, we ask whether you want to do the update, and we have a grant application in uh, to do a quorum-based signing approach so that um, if, for instance, we had a nasty court order or someone just flogged our private key that we use for signing the application, once you have a quorum system in place, they would also have to flog some from several other organisations that we will uh, engage with who will all each have to collectively sign each update of the serval mesh. Um, and if they knew that our key got captured when they put the next update out, they would remove us from the list of authorised keys from that quorum and find another organisation to replace us. We think that's a really cool idea. It's a whole pile of <laughs> tricky things on their part. Distributed trust on a distributed telecommunications network. And we want organisations in countries that do not have mutual extradition treaties. We want resilience at every level in communications. And I have one minute left, so this is going to be really, really fun. Um, so Rise of Security, um, you can read the document. Um, several map. <laughs> It's really, really cool. Talk to us about it after. We can put points of interest on a map, share them via Rhizome. And the really cool thing is, um, meshes are hopeless at getting stuff globally without a backhaul. However, map and geotagged information of use to people in a local area is logically most available to them in the local area via the mesh, because that's where the data is. Um, we can, you know, if you were to fly into an area where people were using several maps and you did not have the map for that area, you would soon get the map from the people in that area. Um, and likewise, if they came to your area, they would copy, it would get copied off uh, your phones. So, uh, we've done some work with New Zealand Red Cross, and we're going to do some more uh, in about three weeks' time. Again, talk to me about it. Look, there's some pretty pictures. <laughs> um, and we do stuff with, uh, with commotion, and we really want to make this helper um, device that can get rid of all the ad hoc mesh problems by having the RF uh, interfaces on there and do the ad hoc and access point at the same time. And I'm probably out of time. So I'll just keep pressing buttons here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, do we have time for questions or not?